And in our life, when we look at our relationships and we look at our families and we look at our friends, uh, co-workers, and fellow students, we see a lot of casualties. We see a lot of casualties of spiritual warfare. We see a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, and a lot of scars. Sometimes we look at this and, and we say, how is Jesus going to give me life and life more abundantly? But yet at the same time I turn around and I see Satan and I see the schemes and I see all the problems of his life. And how in the world am I going to put those two together? How can Christ give me life and more abundant life? And sometimes I feel like I'm just trapped in this life, this schmuck life. I just keep on doing the same old stuff and I can't get ahead and every time I do something I, I, I see my adversary and, and I just feel like I can't get ahead. And I talk to people over and over, week after week, month after month, that they seem powerless in their own life. And today what I want to do is I want to give you a, a challenge to have power in your life to make those personal changes. I'm not talking about uh, vocational changes. and I'm not talking about making all kinds of major changes within your life. I think the most important changes that you can make within your life are those internal changes. Those things that you have to make a decision in. Those things that motivate you. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43 says, he says, I, I, I want you to forget the things that, that you have done in the past. I need you to just to, to forget about it. And I want you to dream about the things that I can do for you into the future. And I think before we can ever deal with the changes of our life, we have to have a dream. We have to know that God wants to do something big and bold within our life. If we do not have the ability to trust in God in the things within our life, we are going to remain stuck in the status quo. In Isaiah 43, verse 18, it says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Isn't that awesome? A new thing. Something that's fresh. Something that's so awesome. And I, I love doing uh, premarital counseling. Because in premarital counseling, it's, it's the dream phase still. Um, I have... Uh, four, four or five weddings coming up, and they're all like back to back to back, and we're doing, we're doing the dream phase, and, and we're talking about um, marriage, and we talk about, what do you want your life to be 10 years from now? Oh, wouldn't it be awesome? They said, we would like to have a, a, a house and a, a white picket fence. And like in 10 years, we'd like to have a couple kids. And, and it's like, uh, da, 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 da. and it's, it's all dream. It's all fresh. It's all new. It's all exciting. And it's awesome to, to sit there and, and just get into their minds that, that God is giving to them something that's fresh, something that's new, something that they can anticipate about. They don't have to dream about the past they get to dream about the future. And I think in some of our lives and in our counseling and our couples, we have to say, do not remember the former things. Get rid of the past and dream about something that I can give to you into the future. So often we have no dream about tomorrow because we're stuck right now. Or because of the past has hindered us, handcuffed us to a point that we say, I don't know what to do. I'm powerless. So because we feel like we are powerless, we have lived the life that Satan has captivated us. He has tripped us up. He has snared us. And you know the key word that Satan wants to snare us? He, sometimes he just dangles things in front of us. Like our, our failures of the past or sometimes the, the things that we are weak in. And because we have failed, he keeps on putting the same failures in front of us. We keep on failing in the same way because we don't know what to do different. We just do what we want to do in our own power, in our own authority. And Satan is sitting there tripping us up. And he says, see, you can't even do that one time. Every time you do this, you fail. You can't win. And we start believing the lies of Satan because of the failures that he causes. Now, Satan can't make us sin. We have our own will. We have to make that decision ourselves. But he can put those snares in front of us. 
He can cause things to take place, but it's our free will to do that. So if it is our free will to either trust God or to rely on our own power, what do we do when that takes place? I believe there's a very simple outline that I want to share with you. And today you're just going to get some, some overflow stuff, some stuff that um, I've been uh, praying about, reading about, studying for counseling. And, and uh, today is, is I just want to give you some black and white Bible stuff, some stuff, some application sermon. This is not a, this is not a you should type of sermon. This is how you should. This is, this is like if I'm struggling in relationships, if I'm struggling in my own personal life, I, I just want to, how to have the power to change personally. Because I do not believe that we will change where our direction is in our own personal life until we can first do these five simple points. And the first thing is, I believe it's very important, is we need to be self-aware. Self-aware. We're going to do an acrostic of start and be self-aware. You got to know what you don't know. Sometimes we get tripped up because we really don't know what we don't know. We are living a life over here where God wants us to do this, and everything that we're doing is counterproductive to what God truly wants for us to do. Self-aware is being aware of our own life, our own mistakes, our own failures. Being self-aware is being able to see your own faults in your life. Wow. It's easy to see somebody else's faults. Oh, I, I, you can come into my office and I can tell you all day long your faults. I can say this, 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 and this, and you do this, this, and this, and that, and that. I, I could tell you and you could tell me my faults. But it's very difficult to tell myself my own faults. Now, I may be able to recognize them. I may be able to see that's where I trip up. But to look at my own self and to be self Aware means I can see my own mistakes and my own failures and the purposes behind my failures. And when I can see that, I guarantee what I can do is I can start making the proper changes in my own life to have the power to make the changes. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, it says, <coughs> excuse me, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Wow, that's so simple. I love the book of Proverbs. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes will never be successful. A man that can say, you know what? This is my deal. I goof this one up. I own this one. When I can own this one, I can take ownership in my mistakes. I can say, I was wrong. Forgive me. I could take ownership in that. Um, this is a, um, we had a funeral Wednesday at a, at a funeral home here for a lady that used to go to our church. Her name, her name was Jody um, Reagans. And uh, Jody and Don were married for about eight years and um, they were an interracial couple. And uh, um, Setting up at the uh, obituary time, we had an open mic. And um, Jody's sister had passed away four years earlier. And, uh, and Jody and Don started dating. Jody's sister's son didn't like, didn't like Don and Jody dating. And didn't like them getting married. And, uh, and uh, during the open mic time, he came up in front of the entire family and friends. And uh, he said something that was very shocking to me. He said, uh, look straight at Don. And he said, Don, um, when you and Jody started dating, I was not in a good place in my life. And uh, I said some very hurtful and very hateful things to you about a lot of different things. And uh, he said, I just want to ask you to forgive me. He said, because I was wrong. And he said, Don, you were a good man. And you could see in the entire audience tears coming down everybody's eyes because a time of mourning became a time of reconciliation. A time of thought of honoring Jody became a time of reconciliation. And Don stood up and they came together and they hugged and 
I, got, I just said, guys, we need to stop for a second. I know this is the obituary time and this is the time that we have eulogies and we talk and share. But you know what's the most important thing? More important than honoring Jody is Jody is healed. Jody's going to heaven. But we who are still here, we have this relationship and we have this broken relationship. And what was just taking place, a man, a young man became self aware and he was broken in his awareness and he saw the product of his anger was right here and he didn't care if you were in front of him he didn't care how many people were here he humbled himself and he said I was wrong please forgive me you know the power of those words even in a very awkward setting the power of I was wrong. Please forgive me. Tears across the audience. The words that he spoke were ointment of forgiveness and reconciliation. And I truly believe before we can be self-aware, we need to be able to see, you know what? My life, I have responsibility. I have issues that I must deal with. A sensible man watches for problems and prepares to meet them. But a fool never looks ahead and suffers the consequences. Wow. A sensible man watches for problems. Self-aware. Watches. Knows my personality. Knows my failures. Knows my inadequacies. A smart man or let me say a smart woman, which there's not, so I could keep it on man probably because it fits more people, but a smart person will be aware and see things before they take place because they know his heart and they know where he is weak. So, but a foolish man could care less. He walks around with his head in the sand. and He says, oh, everything's going to be okay. God's going to take care of me. Nothing will ever happen to me. It will never happen to me. And guess what? That's a very foolish Foolish man. Because we have to be very aware. We need to be self-aware. Proverbs 15 says, Plans fail without good advice. Plans fail without good advice. What we must do to be self-aware is we must be able to communicate not only to God, but communicate to others about our failures, about our issues, about what we can and we cannot do. And I like what Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10, it says, If you give up when troubles come, it just shows that you are weak. If you give up just because it gets hard, you are weak. It is the hardest thing that we will ever do is to face our issues, face our own problems. We can't just stick our head in the sand and hope they're going to go away. We have to look and identify what is it in me that keeps me from doing what God wants me to do. What is it in my relationships that keeps me from struggling? I, I, I feel like I'm a failure. I feel, like, I feel like it's the deja vu all over again because I have to be self-aware. If I am the common denominator to the problems, I have to be the fix. I have to fix the problem instead of continue to be the problem. If we fail to prepare, we fail to listen. If we fail to listen, what we have, we become so arrogant to think, I don't want anybody to know that I have a problem, and I don't want to admit that I have a problem. I will try to fix all kinds of issues, all kinds of symptoms. We call them sm smoke and mirrors. We can talk about all kinds of different things. We could talk about this issue, this issue, this issue, and this issue. But to be self-aware is, I'm not going to talk about the symptoms of problems. What I have to do is I have to deal with the root of the problem. And until I deal with the root of the problem, it'll never be fixed. We can deal with symptoms all day long. Symptoms are going to be reoccurring, reoccurring, reoccurring until we get into the meat of the matter. And you, myself, being self-aware, opens that door to be able to see the issues. The second thing is we need to take an inventory, an inventory of my life. I need to see why I'm where I'm at. I don't believe that we can investigate how to be 
how to have a positive future until we first understand where and how I got to this point. Galatians chapter 3 verse 4 says, You have experienced many things. Were all those experiences wasted? And he says, I hope not. He said, the experiences of life, positive and negative, have shaped us to be who the person we are. Either we learn from our mistakes or we fail because of our mistakes, but those mistakes can either make us or they can break us. Either they can keep us strong for God or they will get us fearful of God. But the mistakes or the failures of our past, the problems that we have gone through, what it either does, it either opens our eyes as the goodness of God or it closes our hearts to the goodness of God. It's either we see God as a mean, hateful man that if I do something wrong, he's just going to beat us up with a stick. Or if I do something wrong, he's going to love me and forgive me because he loves me. It's all in our perception. If our mistakes of our past, if our failures of our past have caused pain, sometimes we have closed our hearts to the forgiveness and the love of God. You know, my mom would never, I, I'm the baby of eight at the house and and uh, being the baby of eight, I had three brothers that was the same age, well, not the same age, but right before me. And during the summertime, my mom never spanked. She, she just said this, wait till your dad gets home. Anybody say, wait till your dad gets home? I hated that stinking statement. Wait till your dad, because mom would just, about four o'clock, dad got home at 4.30. About four o'clock, she goes, boys, boys, come in. I don't want to come in. I, I want to play. Come in. She would have a firm voice. She couldn't spank. She, she was a wussy, but, but she, would, she would make us come home. So we'd come to the house about 30 minutes before Dad got home. We would sit on that couch just waiting. You know, the waiting of anticipation to get, your, get spanked was, was terrible. But I was the baby, so Dad would get home, and Dad just would get his belt out, and he would start with the oldest and go down. And by the time he got, he was mad. I mean, I, mean I, I thought he would get tired. I think the man had more strength after he whipped three of them because I was sitting there, and I was just, Oh, man, it hurt. But you know what? God does not punish us in anger. God disciplines us in love. Now, here's the thing. God disciplines those that he does love. God doesn't want us to stay where we are. God wants us to mold us and make us to be who he wants us to be. My dad punished us he loved us, but he punished us because mom got mad at us. So dad had to do what mom told him to do. But, but dad would punish me because he, he would just get after it. So if I was scarred because of my dad's punishment plan, I could very easily look at God and say, I am fearful of discipline. Because that's the way I look at my dad. That's the way I look at my mom. Or that's the way I was disciplined. When we look at God, we can't look at him as somebody that punishes us because he's mad at us. We have to look at God as somebody that loves us enough that he wants to keep us from harm. Sometimes those people that love us the most are the ones that are willing to get into our face. God loves me enough that he is not afraid to get into my face. If God doesn't get in your face... You may not be his child. Because God loves those that love him. And he wants to discipline those that love him. So if you have stuff going on. And you have problems. And God is in your face. You can say thank you. Let's take an inventory. He, ta he gives us these things. First it's our personal experiences. We have to look at our personal experiences. The things that I have done in the past. Shape me. Do I am now. Now, we can say, I understand that in, in the positive things. I, I understand that because I, I am good at this. God has made me this way. But sometimes the negative things that have taken place in my past have shaped me. Sometimes the scars in my life have shaped me. But so our personal experiences have shaped us to who we are. And then sometimes our vocational and educational experiences have shaped us. Sometimes who we are and what we do for a living shapes us. Sometimes it gives us a different view of different things because of our vocational or educational experiences. And then here's a big one. Our spiritual experiences have shaped us. Our worldview has shaped us. Our spiritual 
world view. How do you see things? See, because a child of God sees things differently than the world does. If we are really God's child, when things take place, we can see things spiritually and we can see things how God wants us to see it through the lens of our spiritual past. Spiritual experiences have shaped us to a point that everything that we do, everything that we say should have a spiritual focus behind it. Now, sometimes we have seen this a lot of times that when kids have grown up in church um, and then they graduate from, from church and they say, you know, I, I did the church thing when I was a kid, but you know what, I, I, I want to make that decision myself. And so they, they, they leave church for a while because they said we tried the church thing. Even though they have tried the church thing, the things that we teach, the Holy Spirit of God that's implanted, will always be able to see the things of God within their life. It's called the implanted Word of God. And the implanted Word of God, when, when something takes place, is something bred within their soul to know, I need to get back to God. It is that, that desire within their life to know that God loves them, that there's something missing within their life. They may not be uh, hellions, and they may not do everything wrong. They just may not be doing what God truly wants them to do. But what happens is the experiences of the past, the spiritual condition of their past, even the problems of their past, what God does, he shapes them to a point that he brings them to a place where they know they need Christ. They know that they can't do this without God. And then Sometimes our painful experiences of our past have shaped us to who we are today. Now, I have counseled many people that have very deep scars within their life. And everybody could say, I've got a few of those scars myself. And the past and their pain and their hurt and those scars that are soul-wrenching scars. Oh, everybody can see the scar on your arms and on your face. And those scars could be easily hidden. But the soul scars, the scars that have dealt with our life on the inside, those scars, they shape us. Somebody can say something and do something to remind us of a very painful time in our life. And it hurts. It hurts deep. But they shape us. We have to take an inventory of our life. We have to understand to be self-aware but we have to look at why. Why am I here? Why am I in this situation? Why is my relationships in this situation? Why am I failing in this situation? Maybe it's even positive. Why, am, why is God blessing me the way it is? We have to look deep within those issues and we have to take an inventory. And then we have to ask this one question with that inventory. What have I learned? Yeah, it doesn't do us any good to, to not learn. E even after you, you read a book or, or take a test, the bottom line is, what have I learned? What, what have I retained? And in our life, if we stick our head in the sand and we live our life, but we can't apply, what good is it? What good is reading a book if we don't retain information about the book? What is going to a seminar and not retaining something from that seminar. What have I learned? I'm 51 years old. What have I learned? I hope that what I can give to you and what you can give to others is out of the overflow that if I can live my life out of the lens of spirituality, I can be myself. And I can take an inventory of myself and I can just say, this is, this is what God has taught me. I don't know everything, but I know, I know this is what God has done for me. And if I can take out of my inventory and I can say, this is what I've learned and this is what I can do to help, I believe that's when God does great things. So be self-aware. Take an inventory. And then after we're where we are, we need to act in faith. This is where I am in life. I, I could tell you how I got here. We all have a different journey of how we got to where we are today. Some of us feel like that we're doing really good and some of us are, are limping in. Sometimes we feel like, I don't know if I can go another day. Sometimes we feel like, this, I don't, I don't want to go another day. 
And sometimes we're walking in and saying, man, I got a raise this week. Man, I'm doing great. Everything's wonderful. Everything's wonderful. Everything's happy. And then you're we're sitting on this side. Other people are sitting this side. And we're just like this gigantic mix of people that are, some are happy, some are sad, some are great, some are not. What do we do with that? We have to act in faith to know that I am where I am right now so God can do something within my life. If I am not going to offer my life to God, I'm going to be miserable. According to my faith, God can do great things. Or my lack of faith, God cannot do things within my life. The very simple statement, it is very powerful. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. According to your faith. According to your ability to know God can take over my life. God can do whatever he wants. The, the story, <coughs> excuse me, in Mark chapter 2, when, when the paralytic guys, when the guy that's paralyzed, four guys carried the paralytic guy to Jesus, and they uncovered the roof, and they lowered the boy down right in front of Jesus. You know what Jesus said? He didn't look at the paralyzed guy and say, oh my gosh, you're paralyzed, what are we going to do? He looked at the four guys, he says, because of your faith, I'm going to heal your friend. God has creative healing powers within your life. And what we have to do is we have to give our life, our soul, our purpose, our failures to God and let God do what only God can do. We have to have faith. My, I can't do this. I, I, have, I have lived my life with my head in the sand so long. I, I have to have faith that God is going to do what he wants to do. I have to, have, I have to be like that young couple sitting in the office, getting ready to get married. I have to have faith. God put me together. God, God created us. He, out of two people, God put us as one. And my future is secure. Why? It's because God put us together. They're not in my office thinking they're going to get married for three years. No, they, they, they think God put them together and their life is ahead of them. That's the type of faith that we have to have. We have to have the faith of God to say, you know what, if I give my life to God, God is going to heal me. He's going to create something new within me and he's going to give me a vision and a hope and a future. We go to God and say, God, if you can fix this, try it. God doesn't want to just fix you. God wants to give to you a hope, a future, a power. But it's not according to your faith. God, if you want to do something great, no, we need to grab a hold of God. When you say, God, because of you, you can do something great. Let me forget the things I've done in the past. I want to honor you, and you can create within me a new thing, a brand new thing, a new future. We can't be afraid, though. Proverbs 29, 25, being afraid of people can get you into trouble. Being afraid. What we can't do is we can't worry about what somebody else thinks. I, I can't tell you how many times people fail to make proper changes because they're afraid of what somebody might think. You know that somebody is not held, held accountable to you. We are accountable to our own actions. The Bible says it's appointed a man who wants to die and after that the judgment. Every one of us are accountable to every decision that we make. Not only our spiritual decision, but every decision that we make, we're held accountable to that. So we can't let somebody, somebody that's not important in the spiritual, eternal things to change what you do because you're afraid of what somebody would think. We can't be fearful of that. So we have to act in faith. And then we have to refocus. Um, refocus. I need to refocus my thoughts. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. When you start saying, I can't, I've always, I, I'll just fail. I've tried it before, and it just never has worked. So you don't, why, why should I even try? We have talked ourselves into failure because in John chapter 10, Jesus told us there's an adversary out there that wants you to lie. He wants you to die. He wants to strip you from all joy. 
He wants to give you absolutely nothing to live for. He warned us about it. He said, I, gave, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So we have to put into, what are we going to do? Sometimes we need to change our focus, our thought life, and say, I am not going to live in Satan's mindset any longer. I'm going to say no to the things that Satan wants and yes to the things that God wants. Be careful how you think. The Bible says we should take every thought captive. Every thought. It's very easy to go negative. It's very easy to go, well, I can't. But what we can do is say, God can. We have to think that. According to your faith, we can do things. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, by the transforming of your mind, the renewing of your mind, the changing of your mind. How do we do that? Is we have to baptize our minds, our thoughts into God's word and let God do the changing. So when we could do that, how can we change? How can we refocus? If it's a golf term, how do, how do we get that mulligan? How do we, how do, we do a do-over? We have to trust that God loves us. He's not willing to keep us where we are. You know, I love watching kids grow up. You know, I've, been, I've had the privilege of here being 15 years as the pastor here. I've seen a lot of kids um, be born. and a lot, I was you know, 10 years old when they got here. Now they're 20-some years old. And now they're having, having kids. And I get to see them grow up and become the person that they are. And um, there's all kinds of different phases in people's lives. Sometimes they, they come through different phases and sometimes they're rebellious and sometimes they're spiritual and sometimes uh, they go through the punk stage. And, you know, it's just fun watching the rebellion of their life and how God has, has fixed that and loved that and helped them. And now they're older and they know exactly who they are. They know exactly who they are. I am so glad that because they had a phase when they were 16, 17, 18, 20 years of age, that they are not held to that phase of life. Aren't you? I mean, have, do y'all ever go through a phase that you say, man, I'm glad I'm not at that phase anymore? I mean, I, I have quite a few of those phases. But what we have to do is we can't be held to a phase. We are held to God's word. And what that means is, you know, God loves us through every phase. And, and there's going to be times in our life that we're dry. There's going to be times that we're spiritual. There's going to be times that we feel deflated. But God wants us to always know that he loves us. We have to refocus our thoughts, put our trust in God. When we can do that, the start of the life gives us peace. And here's what it is. We have to trust. Trust. Trust God to help us to succeed. We have a hard time trusting. I have a hard time trusting. I'm one of those, um, one of those guys that I have a hard time giving power and authority away. I'm a control freak. And uh, um, it's very hard. But when you give something away, you got to say, it's not mine anymore. And if I give it away, it's your responsibility. Take it, run with it, let's make it happen. I will back you, I'll support you, I'll help you, but once I give authority, it's yours. Once I trust God for my life, my soul, I gave him my life. I have to trust that God can take care of my life. I, I trust him for my soul. I could, I could tell you 20 Bible verses that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven because I trust in God and I know that he died on the cross for my sins. I could tell you all kinds of eternal destination issues and I have confidence in my salvation. And you can too because we know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But what about trusting God today? What about that sin? What about that relationship? What about that anger? What about that thing I gave over to him last month? What about all that junk that I said, Lord, I need your help with? But the issue was resolved. You got out of the foxhole and there's no more bullets flying over your head. I'm all right now. But in the midst of the danger, in the midst of the failure, 
Man, I got on my knees and God, please, if you get me out of this one, I'll do whatever you ask of me. Well, there's no more problems. So I don't need to trust in God. We haven't learned from our past. Forget the things that were behind us. Give them to God. And let God do a new thing. A new thing. A fresh thing. If your marriage is stagnated, if your relationships are hurting, if your soul is struggling, if your life is in chaos, trust in God. Get your head out of the sand. Don't hope it'll be okay next month. The hardest thing that you can do is to stand up and say, I'm going to face this issue straight on. Whatever it is. The hardest thing is the first thing. The hardest thing is to be self-aware. I need this. Because until we admit I have a problem, I can tell you all day long what your problems are. I'll never fix you. You can never fix me. I can only let God fix me. We need to look at that. If you're not happy where you are spiritually, if you're not happy your condition, if you can't lay your head down at night, talk to God. If you can't trust him with your sin, if you can't trust him with your life, we have a problem. You have a problem. What we must do is according to my faith, he will do. I have to have faith that God loves me. You have to have faith that God loves you. Trust in your issues. Let God deal with them. Take an inventory. Why am I here? It's mine. I am here because of me. And if somebody did something to me and it put me here, I give that to you, God. I, 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 I'm not going to hold that any longer. I'm going to give my life to you, period. And I'm going to trust that you will take care of me, period. I'm going to give it and let it go. And here's what he says. I'm going to create in you. I'm going to create a brand new life. I believe God looked at them and said, don't worry about the things of the past. Look at what I can do for you. I want to create and give you something that you can never get on your own. And when God does that for us, when he creates and fixes those things that we feel like are failures, God does the thing. It, we just get to be the recipient of God's blessing. The sweetest thing that we could do is trust in God. But you have to do it. You have to give it and let it go. It's his. You've been bought by the price. And that price is the blood of Jesus Christ. You're his child if you've given your life to Christ. He has given to you the greatest thing that you could ever have is your eternal life going to heaven. And somebody give me an amen. amen. Spiritually. Physically. Emotionally. And relationally. He wants to do that same thing. We can't just pick and choose which God we want. We can't just pick and choose. We want the God of eternity. We have a God of life. And we know where we're going when we die. But you know what? The greatest thing about salvation is God wants to help us today while we live. He does not want us to go through this life defeated, beat up, and burned out. In John chapter 10, I want to give you life and life more abundantly. That's today. If we are not living a victorious life, we are living a life away from God's will. You're listening to the wrong person. I have given you life, life more abundantly, but Satan is here to trip you up to cause your life to be a failure. Quit listening to the wrong voice. Listen to God. Allow God to create the new, new life given to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for taking care of us. And Lord, in our failures, in our faults, 
We thank you for rescuing us and even disciplining us because you love us. But Lord, I allow, allow our hearts to focus on you. Let us begin fresh and new where we have failed you. Forgive us. Allow us to do the greatest thing, trust in you in every area of our life. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You know what God desires more than anything else? He does not desire church attendance. He does not desire you to read the Bible. He doesn't desire necessarily for you to give your money. God's ultimate desire is for a communion, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. That means this. You don't have to be at the altar to talk to God. You don't have to be singing a song to talk to God. Worship is you and God. If you have an issue, if you have a problem, all you have to do is bow your head before God. God hears the very intent of your heart. It's communion. It's worship. Anytime that you need God, anytime that you have an issue, anytime that you need worship, you can just say, Lord, I need to talk to you. And he's right there with you. Communion with you. Worshiping with you. Loving you. And helping you. You don't have to come to the pastor. You don't have to come to the church. You have the advocate with you right now. He lives within your soul. And he wants to talk to you. So, when you want to talk to God, close your eyes and say, Lord, we need to have a talk. Let him take care of you. Let him love you. Let him fix you. Let him give you a life, a new life, a fresh start that can change your future. God bless. Pastor Al.